I'm going to read some scripture from three different areas. We're going to cover the Christmas story. It's exciting. It's exciting. Who likes Christmas? Not everybody likes Christmas, you know. Because events in time, they, they bring up memories of stuff that's happened at this time of year. If you've lost a loved one, something, you had some traumatic event happen to you at Christmas, then Christmas is going to bring up the memories. So not everybody looks forward to it. I had a guy in, in this church once. He was a little, little Scotsman, and uh, he was an amazing guy. He used to turn, little old fellow he was, and uh, he used to turn up at 7 o'clock every Sunday morning to set church up without fail. But come the first week of December, he'd disappear, and no one could find him. You could go to his house and knock on the door. No one... Nobody found him. And he would turn, back, turn up again about March. And he would walk in and just start set doing church. And, and I remember one March morning he came in. I think it was about March. Could have been end of February or something. And he said, morning. Sorry I'm late. He was about 10 minutes late for the morning. But he was about two months late for his roster. And... And he never offered an explanation of why he wasn't there for the two months. He had a traumatic event at Christmas. And he would just go into hiding for two months every Christmas. And he did it for three years on the trot whilst he was here with us. And then he moved away down south of the river somewhere and uh, never saw him again. I often pray for him. And uh, so... If you've, had, if you've had a traumatic event in your life over a Christmas period, which brings back the memories, take those memories captive. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 to take every thought captive that exalts itself above the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Take those, take those things captive and do not let Satan have a victory over your life at this precious time of year. Enjoy the, the celebrations of the birth of your Savior. Don't let worldly events, don't let traumatic events come and cloud the time when you should be most joyous. Amen? And, and I know it's not easy sometimes to do that, but we really must take a step of faith and try to overcome some of these things of the flesh. Let me read quite a, a large portion of Scripture, actually. I'll probably take up most of my time, but that's okay. No better, no better preaching than the Word of God, amen? Okay, so Matthew chapter 1, uh, I'll start at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, remember we preached this a couple weeks ago, uh, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, who remembers that message? But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus." for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him his wife, and took to him his wife. And did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king beheld wise men came from the east, came to Jerusalem. Gaspar. What do you say, Gaspar? What will you bring, Gaspar? 
I will bring him incense called frankincense. frankincense. Come on, you should have been at the concert. <laughs> saying, and Herod was saying, where is he who, was, who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star. Oh, that, sorry. Wise men came from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he? For he who has been born king of the Jews, for we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Let me turn over to the book of Luke. Bear with me. Hallelujah, Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month... The angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man. So you've heard about, you've heard what's happening. You've heard about the angel coming to Joseph. You've heard about the kings, the wise men seeing the star and they want to go worship him. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb And bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And then he goes on to talk about her cousin Elizabeth, who was also about to have a baby. Chapter 2, verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock. By night, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger and suddenly there was there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men amen so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another let us go now to bethlehem to see this thing that which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in a manger. I just wanted to cover those bits of scripture just to cover the people who are in this story. We find in the story, obviously, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. This is the nativity scene, right? We find the wise men, the magi. The people who were stargazers. Far east of old Jerusalem, there lived a group of learned men. Amen. They call us kings, but we are not. We're merely men who've learned a lot. And they could read the stars. Did you know God speaks to people and you can read the stars. We're talking about astronomy, not astrology. Amen? Didn't God take Abraham out of his tent and show him the stars in the sky? What, what was he showing him? 
Just how many there was? No, they could read. They, they understood. They understood seasons. They understood times. They understood what was happening. Because all the glory of God tells a story. Why wouldn't God speak to stargazers through a star? Why? That's our language. Amen? There's Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus and the wise men and the shepherds and the cooks and camel boys. Cookie, can you feed this boy? <laughs> I'm going to have fun up here this morning. Why am I telling you all this? Because you need to know this story. It's, it's not a Father Christmas story. It's a story for you to believe. It's, a, it's reality. I don't know about you for Christmas, but I love Christmas movies. I know they're absolutely not there for biblically, but I just love it. I, there's, there's something, when we use the word magic, we're not talking about the, the black arts. It's something mystical, magical. There's something supernatural. There's something miraculous about our God. And, and when it's put into the story of Christmas, I love it. But I was watching a Christmas movie the other day. I've watched two or three actually over this period of time because I really love them. Even if Father Christmas is in it, I don't care. It's just nice. There's elves and angels and all sorts of stuff, but it's a, it's a movie. But there's something you can learn in everything. And in this movie, or, in, or the theme that was running through these movies that I watched, was that the kids believed and the adults didn't. In Father Christmas, we're talking about. Okay? And the kid says to the adult... When did you stop believing? And the mum says, I stopped believing when I was 11 years old, when I wanted this certain present, and I wrote to Santa every week for a month, every day for a month. And on Christmas morning, when my presents came out, I am done all the presents, and they were lovely presents, but I didn't get what I asked for. And I stopped believing. You know where I'm going? They said to the dad, when did you stop believing? He said, when I was three. Why did you stop believing? When I didn't get what I asked for. And do you know there's people in bed this morning who are not believing who are not in church, who are not in fellowship because they didn't get what they asked for from God. But I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and God didn't give me what I asked for. So I guess he doesn't exist. You're understanding me this morning. God is not here to be our Santa Claus. He's not our Father. He's our Father Christ, not our Father Christmas. He's our Father Christ. Amen. Isaiah says, And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Christ, we know him as the Son. But he's also the Father. And he gives the greatest gift, eternal life. He gives you what you need, not always what you want. Although King David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 23. But I want to just briefly pinpoint some things in the characters of our story this morning that should be in your life. Just because this event took place over 2,000 years ago doesn't mean that it's outdated. 
And I have a real concern for our church today. Not just this church. I, I, I opened up with this last week. But this concern is sitting heavy on my heart. That we don't put every, that we don't go out and do whatever we want and sin however we want and put it down to modern church. Well, that was the church then, Pastor. You've got to understand we're more modern now. What's more modern? Your sin is not more modern. It's the same sin that Adam and Eve fell in. It's the same sin that all the people right through the Word of God and through the generations have fell in. I don't want the lights turned off in the church. We're children of the light, not of the darkness. I don't mind a few colored lights, that's okay. But I don't want that I don't want to praise God in the darkness. I want to praise him in the light. I don't need music and lights to create an atmosphere for me to worship God. He is my atmosphere. Hallelujah. Because if you can only worship him if the atmosphere is right, you need to get saved. You need to fall on your knees. You need to declare that Christ is the Lord. You don't need music to worship God. Actually, singing is very little to do with worshiping God. We worship God with singing. We love to do that. But worshiping God is not about half an hour on a Sunday morning between 9.30 and 10. Worshiping God is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and an extra one every four years. Hallelujah. You don't even get that day off. Try that with your wife, men. I'll love you and serve you for 364 days a year. But just on that other day, let me go and do whatever I want to do. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I just want to do what I want to do. What do, what do you mean? I just want to go and be with someone else for one day of the year. You'll have me for 364 days a year. Try that with your wife, men. She's going to slap your face. But we do it with God. Well, love you, Lord, and I lift my voice on Sunday morning. But where am I on Monday morning? Hallelujah. God, let me get back to this. Mary. Let's start with Mary. Becky did a good job as Mary. And I'm glad you didn't dress Misha in pink to play baby Jesus. The angel comes to Mary, put yourself in Mary's position, men and women. And the angel comes and tells you that God has done a miracle in your life. Well, let me tell you, God has done a miracle in your life. The same miracle that he did with Mary. You will be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and you will carry the Christ. Who lives in you? Jesus Christ. Amen. He's growing in you. And if Jesus lives in you, you're never going to live the same as when he didn't live in you. Let me ask all you, you women who have carried children. You don't live the same as when you weren't carrying children. Now you're carrying Christ. And, this, and the angel said to Mary, this is how it's going to be. She did not understand it. Give her a break. She's a young teenage Jewish girl and an, and an angel appears to her, scares the living daylights out of her. That's what the Bible says. And the angel says, fear not. Amen? What do you mean, fear not? I got this angelic being just appeared before me and is talking to me and telling me things that I don't understand. How can I have a baby? I've never known a man. But listen, 
Listen to what she said. But let it be done unto me according to your word. And God will ask you things and tell you things and you will say, how can that be? When God told me I was going to preach in India, what? How can that be? I've never even been there. I don't speak the language. I don't like the food. That was me. But let it be done unto me according to your word. And a month later, I was in India. Preaching the gospel, seeing people get saved, healed, delivered, set free, and loving the food. Absolutely loving the food. And I've become an India freak. Like, it's my second home. And this time next week, what's the time? 20 to 11? About 10 past 8, is it, in India? Yeah. I will be in worship, getting ready to preach at the Sunday morning service. Let it be done according to me. Let it be done unto me according to thy word, Lord. When God tells us something, he's going to back it up by his word. So if he just says, and you say, oh, God said this to me, and I'm going to say, show me where that is in the word. Show me where God does that in his word. Because if you say, oh, well, God says it's okay for me to go live with that girl, I'm going to say, show me where that is in the word. Because my God says, don't do that. Mary had never known a man. And that's how it should be. That's how it should be. And according to the word of God, let it be done unto us. We are carrying Christ. How can that be? Paul said, you are living epistles, letters, known and read by all men. Everywhere you go, everywhere you are, everything you say, you represent Jesus Christ as a born-again Christian. Everything. So if you're in the casino, guess who's in there with you? Jesus. And Satan. Oh, he's there all the time too. But he's not inside. He's tapping you on the shoulder. If you're, wherever you are, whatever you do, wherever you're going, you're taking Christ. And you are a witness for Jesus Christ. And she brought forth Christ to the world. Who are you bringing forth Christ to? Your unsaved friends, family, neighbours. Every time you're screaming at your kids, men. Men. The neighbours are going, I thought they were Christians. Oh my goodness, listen to them. No self-control. I can say that now, I've got no kids. There's nothing wrong with yelling at your kids. Just shut the door. Shut the windows. Take them out in the bush and yell at them as much as you want. But remember, every time those words come out of your mouth, people are watching and listening and you are representing Jesus Christ. Let it be done unto me according to your word. Joseph is my favorite. Joseph is, a, yeah, that Joseph over there is my favorite. Right? And uh, Joseph is my favorite. Oh, there's another Joseph here. Sorry, I got two. Hey, can you both be my favorites? Yeah. Joseph in the Bible is my favorite. Do you know, I always drop myself in it, don't I? It's only because I saw Joseph at the back. He's not Joseph, he's Joe. Joseph is my favorite because what a man. What a man. I don't want to preach on this because I preached on this two weeks ago. A week ago, two weeks ago, I can't remember. He was a just man. 
and his girlfriend rocks up that he's never had sex with and tells her, him she's pregnant. And do you know what could have happened in that day? They were betrothed, as good as married. He could have took her before the court. They would have dragged her into the street and stoned her to death. That's the law. Because she weren't married, so she's obviously been in fornication. And it was punishable by death. But being a just man, and not wanting to expose her, he thought on these things, had a visitation from God, took her to be his wife. Now listen. This life, you, we don't read any more about Joseph in the Bible. This Joseph, anyway. He's, he's, his job's over. It's finished. He don't last much more in a, a chapter of, in a couple of the books. Yet what a man. What a man who would stand with someone and believe in them. And trust them. According to God's word. What an encourager. What a brother. What an amazing guy. Will you stand up and be the person who will not want to expose anyone's life? Because he didn't know it wasn't sin at the time. Until the angel actually came. But he had to choose what to do first. And then he had the visitation from God. See, every time we turn around, honey, do you know about the guy from the IGB? Do you know what he's been doing? That's sin. That's called gossip. And we will not get a visitation from God and the blessing of God whilst we're in to exposing someone else's life. We're supposed to cover. Cover. This is what Joseph did. Cover. I'm not saying cover sin, but we don't need to expose it. God is good at that. We need to pray for them and don't use it as a prayer point for gossip. Don't go to a prayer meeting and pray like this. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for young Adrian. Lord, you know the trouble and the problems that he has. You know, Lord, about the sin in his life and you know about this and God, you know, I, I just bringing him up before you because we want to pray for him, Lord, because he's, he, you know, he's having trouble and, and blah, blah, and telling God. But what you're actually doing is gossiping in the prayer meeting. Now, there's nothing wrong with coming together to pray for someone. But God knows his problems. God knows his troubles. He doesn't have any. I'm using him as an example. He probably has, but no. I'm just using people as an example, all right? Don't go off and pray for him and think that. <laughs> Bless him. Bless him. He's got no credit on his phone. Bless him. <laughs> Somebody bless him. He will not answer my messages. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm talking about being a Joseph. About... Doing the right thing, being a just person. Amen? What about the wise men? Albert. You say he's the wonderful counsellor. Then, sir, I will give him myrrh. He did, I, you did a fantastic job, mate. Darcy, what a wise man. He is great. Listen to this. The wise men were smart, like Albert and Darcy. They couldn't find another one, so they gave me the job. Actually, they needed for them to look smart, so they chose me to stand in the middle of them, make them look really smart. I know the truth. They went to look for Christ. They went to the look 
to look for the cross. I want to bring one point out here, which will change your life. When they found him, they were under orders from Herod. When you find the Christ, come back and tell me so that I may go worship him also. Was Herod telling the truth? No. What did he want to do? Kill him. But he didn't know where he was. He wasn't a wise man. He was only a king. When these wise men found Jesus Christ, they didn't go back the same way that they came. Think about that for a moment. When you find Jesus, you can't walk back the same way that you came. I'm not talking about geographically now. I'm talking about spiritually. When you find Jesus, you cannot walk the same. They went a different way. I love that scripture. They went a different way. When Jacob fought with, with the angel of the Lord at the brook, all night, the angel put his hip out of place and he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And from that moment on, when God changed his name, Jacob never walked the same again. He walked out of that meeting with God. And when everyone saw him, what's happened to old father Jacob? Who? Oh, you mean Israel. God changed his name and he changed his walk. Hallelujah. If you're a wise man, do you want to be a wise man? You can. Just take a trip with me to the manger and worship the king. Amen. That was Joshua's line. When we find Christ, we need to change our walk. We need to go and walk a different way. We need to have him change our lives. Go and study these people. Let me finish with the shepherds. Maybe kings are not born in palaces. Maybe kings are born in stables so that cooks and camel boys can go worship him too. You're going to burst into song in a minute, I know. But these are all lines from a concert. The shepherds were the lowest caste people around in the Middle East at that time. The Romans ruled. The shepherds were moved out. They were the untouchable people of the area, like the, like the Dalits in India. The untouchable people. They had to go look after, out in the fields, look after the sheep. And who did the angels come to visit? The least of the least. They came and announced the birth to the shepherds. Now, you may feel unworthy today, and it's okay because you are. But know this, you are worthy because of Jesus Christ, because he chooses you. He chose the shepherds to announce the birth of the Christ, and he chose you, and he chose me to announce his birth to and like the shepherds, let us go see this miracle. And they went. They didn't, the Bible didn't say that they bought gold or incense, frank, called frankincense or myrrh. They just came to see the miracle. And the Bible says that they went back to the fields celebrating. Amen. There's a part of each of these characters in this Bible story this morning that we need to be a part of as well. We need to know that Christ is alive in us. 
he lives in us, just as he lived in Mary, the incarnate deity, as we sung this morning. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. The hope of glory. Christ in you. The Joseph in you that would believe in your brother, your sister, that you would stand with them, not to expose them, but to lift them up and see them walk on. The wise man in you that would come and see the Christ and walk a different way. The shepherd in you that helps look after the sheep. The shepherd in you, the lowliness of the believer, the humility of the believer that would come to worship the King and celebrate. Amen.